Welcome to 634. I think I may be a minute late. It's good to be in the house of God tonight. Thank you for being in the house. I know the sunshine man is out there. There's all kinds of things pulling us. Come on, stand with me. Stand with me tonight. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Hallelujah. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. Come on, let's talk to the Father. Lord, we love you tonight. So thankful to be in your house. We come to you in the precious, priceless, perfect name of Jesus, that name that's above every other name. Tonight, Lord, we just ask that as we lift our hands, our hearts to you, heaven be open. Heaven be open, Father. Be a clear channel tonight from us to you. And God, uh, let it be reciprocating. Let it be reciprocating. God, tonight we ask that you'd survey our souls. And God, for everybody that is in this place, that we would all just come being able to yield. And God, asking you to change us, shape us into what you would have us to be. We do not take this time for granted. You are awesome. It's in your name. Amen and amen. Hey, how many of y'all thankful for our young people? All right. Let me have all my kids come up here. All my teenagers, come on up here. Come on, teenagers. You don't, come, you don't care. Come on. Come on. I'm going to ask you all again. How many of y'all thankful for our young people? How many of y'all believe? Stand right here in front of me. Right here, right here. Come right here. How many of y'all think they're going to change the world? All right. Now I'm going to ask y'all again. How many of y'all thankful for our young people? Amen. I'm going to ask you again. How many of y'all believe they're going to change the world? All right. Hallelujah. Hey, guys, y'all come right around here like this and face me. We're going to pray for you all tonight, okay? We're going to pray for you tonight. You can scoot closer to me. I promise I won't bite you. But uh, I want you to know these kids could be anywhere, but they're in church. Can we thank God for the parents, the people that brought them? Can we do that? We want to thank God for them, too. Okay, I'm going to ask, uh, I'm asking some of these young people, if we could pray for you for any one thing, what would it be? And Chloe, your answer was? Boldness. Boldness. Who else? What could we pray for? Go ahead. Boldness. Boldness. Who else? What else? Peace of mind. Amen. Who else? Anybody else? Okay. I want you to know that we're behind you. I want you to know we believe in you. No weight, no pressure, but everything depends upon you all. <laughs> we believe you all are the generation that's going to turn everything around. Amen. And we want to do anything and everything that we can to encourage and support and do all of that. So I'm going to ask the church tonight, if uh, y'all believe in prayer, you still believe in prayer? Anybody that don't, you can stay where you're at. Uh, I love you enough to tell you the truth. But the rest of us, come on in. Let's pray for these young people tonight. Come on. Let's pray for them.
and shame no longer has a place to hide and I am not a captive to the lies oh, I'm not afraid to leave my past behind oh, I won't be shaken oh, I won't Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. When shame. No longer has a place to hide And I am not a captive to the lies oh, I'm not afraid to leave my past behind oh, I won't be shaken oh, I won't be shaken my feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. I love this bridge. There's power that can break off every chain. There's power that can empty out of grace. There's resurrection power that can save. There's power in your Doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your Man, let's give God a hand tonight. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of our God. Come on, sing with me. There is a river whose streams
is a fountain full of grace and it flows from the man you as raised. He came and it healed me. He came and refreshed me. He came and it washed my sins away. And I will for all that you've done for us. God, tonight I could sit here and just count all the blessings, God, that you've given, not only me, but every one of us. God, tonight let us worship in spirit and in truth. above all men.
Give him some praise, man. So good. So good. All right. We're going to let our young people go out tonight. We're going to go ahead and let them go. And I don't know for sure who has my younger group tonight. Thank you, Miss Christie's got that younger group tonight. Of course, Josh and Jenna have our uh, teenagers there. And I'll stay in there with the rest of you teenagers. If you have your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 4. I have preached out of this so many times, but boy, what an absolute uh, foundation to Scripture as far as for ministry in all of our lives. So the Word of God says in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 1, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, turn to somebody and say, I didn't know you had a ministry. <laughs> Therefore, seeing we have this ministry. See, you need to understand, once you became a Christian, you were then entrusted with ministry. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, As we have received mercy, we faint not, but have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. The word says this, in whom the God, and this tells you what we're up against, 
It said, In whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. So you and I are wondering, why don't they get it? The enemy is blinding them. Now understand that those blinders that he puts on can come through pride, jealousies. It can come through so many different things. Anger, lusts. But it goes on to say, for we preach not ourselves. Oh, well, let me back up. In whom the God of this world, the blind of the minds of them which believe not, I want to read it again, lest the light of this glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants. Wow. For Jesus' sake. I love the way verse 6. For God. Wow. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. How did it come? The knowledge of the Father comes through the face of Christ. Wow. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency, the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Wow. I'll build off the scripture tonight. For we are troubled. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of our Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body, for which we live are always delivered unto death for Jesus sake that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh why am I going through what I'm going through that's Jesus working in us and through us pray with me Lord I'm so humbled by your word tonight there's power in it and God tonight I pray that as your word comes across these lips of clay that it would come unadulterated, that it would come with full truth, full power. God, that if there's a lost one, they'd be saved. If there's a broken one, they'd be fixed. God, tonight, that those in despair would find joy and the hopeless, God, be just absolutely enshrouded with hope. Jesus, more than anything, let us glorify your name. It's in your name we pray. Amen and amen. You can be seated tonight. Thank you, praise team. I appreciate you so much. You might want a pen tonight. I'm going to give you three or four things that I think will help you. If I'm going to call this anything tonight, because we're troubled on every side. We go through that list, and it's hard. It's a hard piece of scripture for me to learn. I've, I've rehearsed that and rehearsed that, and I don't know if it's just a sequence or what, and it seems like it ought to be one that I could bank. You know, I can do the whole 23rd Psalm. We can do the Lord's. But this one here. Tonight, if I could, I want to set this up in a, in a way that this serves for me as a baseline of Scripture. There's some things that, if you will, I call them baselines and boundaries for myself. And, and it's my hope that if it's helped me, hopefully it will help you. And these are some things that I think that if we put in our life, I really think it'll be a help to you. You may want to take notes. You may want to take notes. So without, without going to, without just saying the obvious Surely there's trouble. Surely there's those things. And so what is it that I can have? What is it that I can set in my own life uh, as far as structure goes to help me offset the attacks of the enemy? When I use the word baseline that years ago I went to the doctor and I went to a specialist concerning my back. And they said, how long has it been, Mr. Clemens, since you had a, an x-ray of your back? I said, I don't know how long that's been. They said, well, let's, let's go ahead and get some x-rays. Let's go ahead and do an MRI. Let's go ahead and do all these things so we can get, quote, a baseline. And what we'll do with that baseline is we'll figure out where you're at, and then we'll look at the progression if we can over the years. If there's any future issues, Alvin, then what we'll do, we'll have that as a baseline. So tonight, really the way that I'm presenting this to you is to start a baseline. And with that baseline, it's going to serve as progression. And what this is going to do, it would be my prayer that, that as I state just the obvious here in just a few moments, four things, that it'll serve, as, it'll serve as chocks in your wheels, if you will. If you get on a hill and you're wanting to roll back, this will serve as chocks for you. First piece of scripture, or the second piece of scripture that I want to use is Psalm 86 and verse 10. 
For thou art great, Lord, and you do wondrous things. Thou art God alone. Psalm 86.10. Isaiah 37.16 says, O Lord of hosts, God of Israel, that dwellest between the cherubims, thou art God, even thou alone. Of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. First point I want to make tonight as a baseline, turn to somebody and say, I'm not God. You say, Pastor, that is so simple. You know me. What did you expect? Can I tell you something that will relieve you of a lot of things that if you know what, when other people, that they come and they think that you are or that if you think you are yourself, can I tell you something? Bank this piece of scripture. I'm not God. I can't change everything. I will tell you this, through the power of creating, if you will, through the power of the Holy Ghost, I do believe that I have the power through Jesus to create a certain culture within my home. I believe that within me, through the power of the Holy Spirit and Jesus living on the inside of me, if all things consist through Him, then what I believe is this. I believe that I can create a culture in any sphere that I'm in. But I'm not God. That means that the weight of that is not on me, that's on Jesus. I believe that when Jesus is in the room, things change in the room. You see that what I was telling you? I guess we're going to have to go ahead and do the shirt that just simply says the kingdom just walked in. How many of you believe the kingdom of God is on the inside of you? How many of you already know that Jesus is the kingdom? So I'm going to go ahead and restate this. I've been stating this now for for probably a month or two. But can I tell you something? When the kingdom walks into the room, the world has to bow. Amen? And when the world comes into your sphere, that doesn't mean the kingdom ever changes. The kingdom of God is in righteousness, peace, and somebody shout joy. Joy. Yeah. That's the one I was waiting on. But the kingdom of God. So listen, let me, let me help you with something. What that means is this. When I say that I'm not God, everything does not revolve around me. Everything does not revolve around me. You see, I guess that if we didn't know, as far as speaking on, on behalf of astronomy, do you realize that the earth orbits the what? The sun. The sun does not orbit the earth. But sadly enough, when we're in ourself, we think that everything orbits around our life. If this, can it be this simple? Yes, it can. I'm not God. That means you don't have to bow to me. What pressure is that? I, can I tell you something? If we could just relieve ourselves of that heavy debt of self, And come free before God and say, I'm not God. I can't change everything. I can't make people do what, neither can God because we have free will. But the essence of that, I'm not God. You're like, duh, pastor, we knew that. We knew you weren't God because I am. I know how y'all are. When we do this, the thing is, is that we begin to, to see that in our own life. We will set ourselves up for the fall. What happened to Eve? What happened to Adam? The enemy was good. Deceitful, subtle. But you shall be as gods. He fell for it. She fell for it. And today, through social media and through social different things and through everything revolving around us, can I tell you, the world will make, I'll guarantee you this, I will make it without your selfie. I will. And guess what? I'll make it without my own. I'm too big to fit on that small screen. (laughs) Get over that for a minute. A simple point. I'm not God. You say, Pastor, where do we go? Why the first piece of Scripture? Because so many people are troubled on every side. They care about what you think. They care about what I think. Why don't we start thinking about and caring about what God thinks? What God thinks about our care life. What God thinks about our prayer life. That sounds so simple. But I'll tell you this. If we can get it, and the reason for that, I am not your Savior. Wow. I'm not your Savior. Philippians, let this mind be in you. The Word of God says in Philippians 2, and we'll start at verse 6. Who being in the form of God, speaking of Jesus himself, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal to God. 
but made himself of no reputation. No reputation. He was fine with being a nobody. Made himself of no reputation. What does that mean, Brother Harold? It means this. He didn't bust into the world and say, hey, listen, I'm king. You call me king. But I can tell you this. My kingdom's not of this world. Wow. Wow. But made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. What a beautiful example as we've just come through the Passion Week and different things that there he is, the Son of God, the Savior to the world, King of kings and Lord of lords. And there he is right there at that moment at the Last Supper, what we know as the Last Supper. He, the Word of God said that he takes his towel, he wraps it around him, and he begins to wash their feet. He doesn't pontificate. He doesn't say, hey, you're going to. He doesn't do that. He takes on him the form of a servant. I will assure you that you find a good servant leader. You find somebody that will back up what they're preaching and what they're teaching and the way that they love if they say they love. If you'll find somebody that will back it up by action, you'll follow them. Jesus was easy to follow because he backed it up in service. He backed it up in love. I don't know if you know it or not, Brother Wayne, I'm a Christian. Well, let me just encourage you and encourage myself too. In order to be a Christian, we must be Christ-like. Well, Scripture just says right here, making himself of no reputation. Taking upon him the form of a servant. Wow. I was in another church within the past two weeks, and I said something that I thought was authentic. Uh, to me, I, several years back, I, there was something that was just laid on my heart. And it was simply this. Save people, serve people. You ever heard that? You've been to church here anytime you've heard that. I went to another church and I seen it in great big letters. And I thought, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I got a little mad and I got over it. I'm just kidding. I thought, I don't know where they got that, but I agree 100%. Because saved people serve people. Turn to somebody and say, I'm not God. I'm not God. Can I tell you this? Pleasing God. Let me go back to, to Philippians 2.8. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself, became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wow. If you're going to get to that place where you can say, I'm not God, you'll understand this. That pleasing God will mean that you won't always please people. But the truth of the matter is this. Scripture says, and we studied this on Monday, we ought rather to obey God than to obey men. Now listen, husbands and wives, that if an issue comes up in your home, you better obey her. Let me move on. We ought rather to obey God than to obey men. What happens is we end up people pleasing. Then I'm not God. That's one of my baselines. The next one is this. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Boy, just simple thoughts tonight. But the joy of the Lord is my strength. Philippians 4.4. 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. And the peace of God. Now, what's it say first? Rejoice in the Lord. And you know what? Half the time, some of the time, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. How many of you know that that's a lot easier said and sung than living? The Word of God says that if we would do this, look what happens in Philippians 4 and 7. The Word of God says this, Lynn, and I love it. He said, in the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. So what has to happen? The joy of the Lord is my strength. That when my flesh and that when everything else is raging and everything else is battling and vying for my mind and my peace, I have to stop and say, wait just a minute. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And then verse 7 comes, and it's powerful. And that peace of God which passes all understanding. Wow. Habakkuk 3, 17, Although the fig tree shall not blossom, neither shall the fruit be in the vines. The labor of the olive tree, even if it would fail, or the olive shall fail in the fields, even if they would yield no meat. 
And even if the flock shall be cut off from the fold, and there shall be no herd in the stalls. Habakkuk, Habakkuk 3, 18 says, Yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. Wow. Pastor, what are you trying to say? That when there's no peanut butter left in the jar. That when, listen, maybe there's more month than I got money. That when things are not turning out the way that I thought. And what we do so many times with God is that instead of God being the preset and being the one thing that preconditions us, what we use so many times, Jenny, is He becomes a default. He becomes the thing, well, if this happens, well, I've still got God. Why not put God out there first? And he says this, and I love what Habakkuk says. The Lord God is my strength. Wow. You're familiar with this one. He said, I will, he said this, and he will make my feet like hind's feet or deer feet, and he will make me to walk upon my hind places. Wow. He's going to give me strength. The joy of the Lord is my strength. It's this simple that when we look at that, we think about the situations, the circumstances that can arise. And I will begin to deduct that if it starts and I'll just stop something and say, wait a minute, this is not going, I just have to stop. But God, you are my strength. You are my peace. And the joy of the Lord is my strength. Now I can tell you this, that if if your quotient on the Lord is, is empty, And that if your reservoir of worship is low, and if you will, if there's a crack actually in the cistern of your praise, and it's leaking out everywhere else, then I'll tell you when you need that strength and you need that joy and you won't find it, I'm going to tell you, you've probably got a broken cistern. There's probably something broken on the inside that God can fix. That God can fix. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Hmm. Romans 15, 13, it says this. I love it. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing. The word says this. Beth, it says this, so that you may have a little bit of hope. No, so that you may abound in hope. (laughs) You may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. How do we get that hope? How do we abound in that hope? Through the Holy Ghost of God. To worship in the Spirit is to worship God in spirit and in truth. God is a spirit and they that worship Him must worship Him in that way. And I will tell you that you can't worship God in spirit without knowing the truth, which is Jesus Christ. Which becomes more than just a common liaison between us and the Father. He becomes absolutely, if you will, the holy channel and viaduct in which we find ourselves in the presence of God. Hmm. Romans 15, 11, These things have I spoken unto you, Jesus speaking, that my joy might remain in you and that your joy might be full. Wait a minute, this is John 15. Two chapters ago, he's washing their feet, he's doing all this. And Barb, what he's doing, he's getting ready to go to the cross. But he says this, these things have I spoken to you, that my joy might remain in you. If he could have joy in the midst of the cross that awaits. Then tonight, can we surrender our anxiousness? Can we surrender the hope or the, or the thought of the cross, whatever it is that we see tomorrow bringing, can we surrender that to Him so that we may have full joy in the midst of the very day that we're living in? Wow. And He said that your joy might be full. I know sometimes when I'm preaching, y'all are looking at me like, I don't know where. He gets up at 2.30 or 3. He's wound up this evening. Where does he get that? It's not caffeine. (laughs) I do have my coffee in the morning. But I will tell you this. There's a joy that when my flesh is tired, my spirit is strong. I say that humbly before you. To tell you that when everything around me looks hopeless, when everything around you looks hopeless, 
be the hope that walks into the room. That when everything around you looks like it's weakened, be the strength. Pastor, you act like I know what I'm talking about because I've had these low times in my life and a particular one could come in. And then sometimes not even with saying, without saying a thing, they just begin to do this, Michelle. They just begin to lift. Thank you. Thank you. When you see the hope, thank you. When you see the hope that is within him and the hope that he had facing Calvary, we too should be able to face tomorrow. I was doing a little bit of study for myself, thought that's where I'd be going tonight, and it was just simply the old song called Because He Lives. How many of you know it? It's an old hymn, 1971, I think. Somebody thought, wait a minute, I thought that was really old. No, it's Bill and Gloria Gaither. They wrote it. And remember the old song, Because He Lives, I Can Face? Wow. Because He Lives, All Fear Is. What a great song. I wonder if we could start believing what we sing. It's that hope in Him. The hope that I have in Him and the joy that I have in Him is guess what? The enemy thought he had Him, didn't he? But then there was that issue that the enemy had to deal with on resurrection morning. And there was an empty tomb. I can full tell you that the enemy know exactly what had happened because I believe Jesus descended into the lower parts of the earth, snatched the keys out of the devil's hand, and said, no longer can you have my people. Wow. Hope. Joy. Joy. (laughs) Jesus said this in John 16, 23. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, what shall we ask in my Father's name? He'll give it unto you. And once again in verse 24. Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full. I've seen people at really hard times in their life. And and we all have them. Some can seem tougher than others. and, And very hard things hit. I've had people ask me before, hey, listen, preacher, hey, pastor, you know what? I I feel like that I shouldn't question God. I I feel like that we're having this. Can I tell you what I encourage? I tell them, I said, keep talking. I said, you keep talking to God. I said, can I tell you something? He's big enough to handle your words. He's big enough to handle anything you throw at him. Don't blaspheme. But I will tell you this, you have that argument with God. Because he's more concerned about your soul and where you're going to end up than anything else. He's big enough. Have that conversation. Be bold enough, brave enough to say, God, why? Many times what I found in my own life, when I've questioned God and had the dialogue with him, it'll simply come back to his two words of trust me. Just trust me. Wow. Wow. Joy. Joy. 1 John 1, 3, that which we have seen and heard and we declare unto you that we also may have fellowship or that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. 1 John 1, 4. And these things write we unto you that your joy might be full. Have you ever just seen somebody full of joy? I know we've seen plenty of people full of themselves. We've seen plenty of people full of religion. I've seen plenty of people full of pride. And many times I've found that maybe all of those looking at the one in the mirror. And the real part of that is that you cannot be full of yourself and be full of the Savior. You can't be full of hatred and be full of hope. You've got to be full of something. But you can't be full of two things. What an epiphany. Because capacity is capacity. Anything less would be mixed. What's God want? What's my baseline? Number one, I'm not God. Number two, joy. Simply joy. Joy. And understanding that the joy of the Lord is my strength. My other baseline is this. If you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians 3 and verse 10. 
This is one that I really adhere to. It's really, it, it's bound by grace. It's interwoven within the very thread of grace. The Word of God says in Philippians 3.10, that I may know Him. I don't know, let me just stop right there at that comma, is that I'm sure that there's many folks that are in this place that say, Lord, I just want to know you. You better look out. You say, I want to know you more. Mm. Look what Paul says. Stephen, this is, this, is, this is very bold, but he said that I may know him. Mm. And the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings, be made conformable unto his death. Wow. Wow. And then this very popular piece of scripture, the next two, brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth to those things which are before. The word says this, I press toward the mark for the high prize or for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. So, Pastor, what's the third point? Kathy, write this down. I ain't there yet. <laughs> Flatter. Just put on yours, Kathy. I'm not there yet. Turn to somebody and say, I am not there yet. This is something that will allow us, that will allow us not to get under condemnation. But at the same time, using the context in, in which Paul was using it, he said, I understand that, that I'm not there, but I keep pressing. I keep pressing. And not, to, not in a relentless way, in such a way that I get wore out, Stephanie, not that. But he said, I keep pressing. And what I see is this, I'm not there yet, but boy, I'm headed in the right direction. Wow. Wow. I ain't there yet. Just a baseline of this. And he says this in Philippians 1, 6, kind of encapsulates to me being confident of this very thing, that he that has begun a good work in you, he will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. I'm almost done. When you look at this, there, there's a certain grace that we have to understand within ourselves. And can I tell you, not only do we need to speak grace, not only do we need to share grace, but we need to sow grace. Not just into other people's lives, but can I tell you something? It is very important to sow grace into your own life so that you and I will have a harvest of grace. Show unto yourself grace. That sounds like such a simple thing. But when you get under condemnation and you're there and you're thinking, oh, I did it again. Why do I keep doing it? And you're just like, and continue, you know, you're just on it. It's like the exercise bike that gets nowhere. I'm not there yet. But man, I'm not back there anymore. And just begin to rejoice. Praise team, will you come? I got one more. So I want you to sit up, if you will, tonight. If we were all before the great physician, I want you to sit up in your mind baseline. And if you could, start measuring. And it'll be my prayer that the Holy Spirit will bring this back to you. As we begin to look at these simple things that we put there, the first one simply being, I'm not God. The second one, the joy of the Lord is my strength. The third one is, I ain't there yet. I hope you wrote those down. Because it's my hope that it'll help you tomorrow. Because I will tell you this, tomorrow will bring a new day. The mercies will be new tomorrow, and the devil may very well have a new tactic tomorrow. But he's defeated in Jesus' name. The weapons that are formed by the enemy shall not prosper against me, you, or my family in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Fourth point. Let me give you a scripture first. Philippians 3, or excuse me, Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. That's one of the first scriptures I think that I banked. Luke 19.10. It begins to, if you will, lay the foundation for every piece of why he came. 
Why did he come? He didn't come, Luke, to establish a kingdom here necessarily in that way. He didn't come even to build a home here. Why? Because his focus would be on building us one there in heaven. The Word of God said that the foxes have holes, the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He didn't get caught up in all that. There's no hymn that said he sought me and he bought me. The old song that says by his redeeming blood. I wrote this down for me. And I want you to take it personal too. I think maybe that's one thing that we, we do. We take offenses, Jake, so quick in the world and we take it so personal. I wish we could do this with the Word of God. I wish we could take the Word of God personal, Kathy. And what I mean by that is that He come to seek and to save that which is lost. I was lost but now I'm found. And I wrote this down because it, it really ministers to my soul. He came looking for me. And can I tell you something? That when you know somebody and you know their habits, they know just where to look for you. My dad, I could pretty well tell you where he would be somewhere around 5 o'clock when he lived at 16th and Broadway in Louisville, Kentucky in the mid-70s, I could tell you where he would be. He would be at Cozy Corner, the bar and grill, right across, right across the street, if you will, across from Joe Hutt Auto Parts. He would be right there across from his little one-room apartment that he had when he stayed in Louisville. He would be there. Friday night, if he didn't come down here to pick up his kids for the weekend, that's where he'd be. Pastor, what's that matter? Jesus knew where to look for me too. He found me in my sin. And all of my muck and my mire didn't keep him away. He waded through what other people said, oh, that's too, that's too much. He said, I'll go in after him. You see, the Word of God said, is His hand, is it not, can it not be stretched out that it cannot save? Jody, is His ear turned, Marianne, that it cannot hear? He came looking for me. Sunday after Sunday, Wednesday after Wednesday and other days, if we could have the passion that he had. If every Sunday that if we came in here looking for the lost. Because I'll guarantee you. There's a lot of religious cloaks that walk in here on Sunday morning. That under the cloak. Is a heart and a root of bitterness and hurt and pain. Hearts of unforgiveness. Hearts of doubt. I wrote down, he was on the trail of my sin. He knew where to find me. I haven't said my point yet, but I'll get there. He bought me, Revelation 1, 5, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, hallelujah, and the first begotten of the dead, and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us, unto him that loved us, and washed us from our sins in his own blood Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ nevertheless I live yet not I but Christ that liveth in me and the life which I now live is by faith in Jesus Christ song Solomon 2.4 he brought me to the banqueting house and his banner over me was love. 
1 John 4, 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. And everyone that, love, everyone that loveth is born of God. And he knows God. In 1 John 4, 8. He that loveth not doesn't know God. For God is love. And I'll close with this scripture, and I'm waiting to give you the point. 1 John 4, 9. And this was the love of God manifested toward us. Because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. 4, 10. 1 John. Herein is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us. And He sent His Son to be the propitiation, the sacrifice, the mercy seat, the expiation for our sins. Point number four that serves as my baseline. I am loved by God. If this whole room was against me, I know God is for me. If the whole world hates me, I am loved by God. Wow. So many Christians that are crippled are, are simply crippled by this, by this thought. God can't love me. I've done too much. I've not done enough. But how simple of an outline can we have tonight simply in this to put four simple things in our life. I'm not God. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Wow. And let them serve as markers. And if you will, just to top it off, I am loved by God. Most of the conversations, I'm closing, but most of the conversations that I have are many that I have. What is it that I find people hindered with? Most will be their worth. Most will be hindered by how either they view themselves or, or the fear of how other people view them. I need to tell you that the Word of God says that David, the Word of God says that David, David was the apple of God's eye. Wow. You're just as important as David was. You're loved by God. So what's the problem? If you're living in sin, God hates it. He hates sin so much that he sent his only begotten son to die for every dirty, rotten thing that we've ever done. That's how much he hates sin. Miss Margie, when I begin to think about that, I, be, I begin to process and I'm thinking that in Scripture, how could it be in Isaiah 53 that it pleased him to bruise his own son for me? That that whipping post was a real place. Crucifixion was a real thing simply because he came looking for me. And the only answer for my sin and the only atonement could only be through the blood. Because without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission of sin. Wow. I don't know what you said as... Parameters in your life, that's a few of mine. But the enemy will want to do anything and everything that he can to take you away. I'm going to encourage you to remain steadfast and sure. I'm going to encourage you tonight that if you have lost your joy, if you've never had joy, then I want to encourage you tonight that if you don't understand the love of God, he is hot on your trail. Tonight, if you don't know if you're born again. Tonight, if it's a rededication, if whatever that it is to come back to him, let's do it. Let's do it. Tonight, if it's just a simple prayer at an altar that says, Oh, Lord, still the very coals, the very embers within my soul tonight. Set me on fire.
said enough. Lord, I love you. Holy Spirit, tonight, that, that may be more of an encouraging word. It'd be my prayer always, God, that conviction would be in place. But God, tonight, if there's anybody watching, anybody in the house that feels like they've lost ground, that maybe tonight is the night we need to get that ground back. Then maybe right now is the time that we come to an altar and we pray, God, maybe for those around us, and maybe, God, we need to be the spark. <laughs> we need to be the spark, God, for others. That, God, tonight, that we could simply take the veil, if you will, and, God, let our lights shine. Just take it off and let our lights shine. I speak joy over the house, Lord. God, I speak life, and not just any life. I speak abundant life. Holy Spirit, I just pray that you quicken all of us to take on, if you will, the heart, the passion that Jesus had that come to seek and to save that which is lost. Thank you, Lord. Somebody tonight awaiting a test result. Somebody tonight in fear of going back. Somebody tonight just, just really that, that just the, the, the relational issues that you're having. I've got your answer. His name is Jesus. If you're here tonight and you've been focusing so much more on what's wrong instead of the things that are right. If you find yourself finding fault with this or with that, oh, Holy Ghost, convict myself. Then God, tonight, let us be convicted. Let us surrender that to you. God, tonight, arrest the apathy, the complacency. That God, whatever it is, that if we wait, we just wait for this, we wait for that. But God, what would hinder us from praying together tonight at an altar for revival? That God, everybody says we're in a race, but the fact is, it's a relay race. And God, that all of us should be handling the torch. And God, tonight, let it be something, God, that, that just begins to, to put something fervent, Lord, within us. That we would understand that we have to pass the torch to the next generation. That there was a generation that knew not the Lord. Why? It's because that generation before them quit speaking of the great things that God, that you had done. Quicken us, God. Quicken us. God, equip everyone in the house. If you're here and you're lost, I'd come. If you're here tonight and you believe in the power of intercession and praying for a nation, there's never been a time that this nation needs God more than it does right now. God, I'm praying that you arise in this nation and let every enemy be scattered. That God let the fear of any other nation that doesn't know you, don't let it be because of an arsenal, God, that man have built and nuclear weapons, but rather let it be that they fear the God that this nation serves. We love you, Lord. Quicken our heart. Amen. This altar's open. On the personal side of things, if you need to pray, pray. Those of you that will, as far as on the congregational side, let's pray. If you say, I can pray there in my seat, I understand that. You're welcome to do it. I'm not going to command you to do anything. But why not pray together in one mind and one accord for revival, not just to start, but to spread. You're welcome to join me. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I praise you.